So, uh, thanks for having me. Uh, we decided that I will take five minutes and tell you about the situation of on skepticism and of Russia. And uh, it's always interesting to know what pseudoscience pop is popular around the world. And each country has its own thing. Like, for example, Australia has dowsing. And the United States probably uh, has the big thing is probably talking to the dead, right? And so in Russia, we have other things like uh, Randy mentioned, remember in his uh, closing remarks about uh, the uh, charging the water? Yeah, louder, right? Yeah, okay. So he was talking about some psychics in Russia charging the water. So you turn on TV and you see them charging the water. That was a long time ago. I mean, they're not there. We're living in the internet age, and nowadays it's tough because we don't have big names to tackle. They're all now on the internet and became very local, so it's, it's tough. And of course, uh, b but there are certain directions that are very popular. And so I'm going to tell you about those. I just will have to make a remark that whenever somebody asks you about like a country or can you tell me like what's going on in Russia, it's always like a burden. Like, and then somebody will say, you know, I don't agree with what you're saying. And so this is just my opinion. I think that I'm in a good position to judge what is uh, what is popular there in terms of pseudoscience, but nevertheless, I could be wrong. But anyway, so the biggest thing, I'll, I'll tell you today about that just two things, which are, which are very important. So the biggest thing uh, in Russia right now is water. And I think that many of you know how water can be pseudoscience, right? So uh, homeopathy, and not just any homeopathy, homeopathy 2.0, you know, like web 2.0, so that's homeopathy 2.0. So whenever, w when everybody now understands that there's no active ingredient in water, then the next logical thing is to say, okay, but water has memory. And so, right, so uh, in Russia, there's a TV channel that does pseudoscientific movies. And they're not just movies, they're blockbusters. They're really well made. You're like, I wish we had scientific movies like that. And so they made two movies about water. And you know, one of the movies, I really want to tell you the scene from the movie. So the movie starts with a really beautifully filmed scene. It's like a desert. And many people, like a group of crowd of people, is walking the desert. And they're dying. There's no water anywhere. And they have like these cool shots of older people just falling down into the sand, and, you know, like the dust that said he's dead, no water. And so they're walking, walking, and then somebody uh, in that crowd just uh, looks forward like, look like that, and his face lits up, water. And then the next frame shows a shot of a beach and sea waves towards that beach. And they're like, okay, so they're carrying a lab to get salt out of the water, or how unscientific can you get on the first scene of the movie? And so it goes downwards from there, and they show that, uh, like, stories are very colorful about experiments that sort of prove that water does have memory and that it reacts to emotion. And uh, one of the last scenes of the movie, they're showing an Indian river, and uh, uh, children are playing there in the water, but the river is very dirty, and there's, like, corpses of animals actually, like, swimming by. And you're like, all right! Yes, water memory, all right. Should, rem should remember everything, right? Uh, and so those movies were very big. And because everything is local now, what happens is that we sometimes attend local screenings of those movies just to see what's going on. And I went to one of those, and uh, that's where it gets kind of sad because uh, there were many different people there. And there was a woman with a, with a child, was like four or five years old girl, and she was watching that movie and actually writing things down. It was like, wow, and I'm looking at that girl and understand that she's not in a very good position. In fact, who knows, maybe she's not vaccinated because uh, these movies usually, they talk, for example, about water, but they touch upon all the other things like GMO and anti-vaccination stuff. So, uh, so people actually watch that, and homeopathy is pretty big in Russia. Uh, Russia has support of acupuncture in law, so you can be officially an acupuncturist. Homeopathy doesn't have that support. As far as I know, they're trying hard. I don't know if they will succeed. Uh, but that would be like, so that's, that's ideology, the actual business model. They have a website. You can actually go and see. I think they have an English version. It's newpharma.ru. Maybe they have newpharma.com. Uh, so th here's what they do. They have uh, virtual drugs. So let's say you, you want aspirin. 
you download Aspirin. So you have to put CD into your CD-ROM if you still have one. And then you have to press the button load and it says loading and you have to wait for 12 minutes. Then you have to take out the CD. Nothing is burned there. But you have to take out the CD. You have to put it on the table, then have a glass of water, put it on the CD, and then wait for 30 minutes and drink it, and that's aspirin. <laughs> and so, uh, and actually, when I tell this to people, they ask, uh, maybe, does the site actually burn something to CD? Is, is there anything going on? And you know that in the web browser, you can look at the source of the page. And so I looked at the source of the page, and I mean, anybody who even had like school programming courses will see that what it does, it has a loop. And it says, until 12 minutes, uh, the, until, uh, well, until you're within 12 minutes, show the word loading. That's all it does. <laughs> and, uh, but the website is actually, I think it's very dangerous because it's a killer for a non-skeptical person. In fact, it's difficult to digest even if you're skeptical because it has a whole huge section on science how science supports this. And half of the articles are genuine. That's real science. Uh, but the thing is that it contains, it has nothing to do with what they're doing, but it has like the word water in it and like something else like charge. Uh, you'd have to go and actually read it to understand that it's, it has nothing to do with it. And the other half is homeopathy journals. And a person who does, I mean, I know, like old lady goes in, onto the website. She won't know. She will just start downloading the drugs. And they, of course, uh, say, well, you don't have, you have to take the real drug as well. But as time goes on, you have to lower the dose. C is a clever. Uh, but of course, uh, the problem is that um, I, I've mentioned aspirin. They actually have a lot of very serious drugs there. So if actually somebody will really do that, that can be very dangerous, and that, that can lead to death in some cases. So this is a big thing. And the other big thing is something that I've uh, investigated, and I've seen, I see this in all countries, but somehow in Russia it's right now like very popular. This is like pseudo-history plus pseudo-linguistics. When they take like words and they start taking them apart and saying that you see this is this is like the, you, like if some words have other words within them, and very often that's just a coincidence. So they use that to argue that that means that history is wrong and you know that country didn't invade that country and that king never existed and Russians are the best, you know that kind of stuff, and uh, it all. It all's, uh, about, it's in the society of people who think that you should be closer to nature and that ancient people were wiser and modern science doesn't get it. And so this is very, very, very big. So yeah, so these are the things that we're up against. Of course, we have the background of all the other stuff that everybody else has. Uh, Anti-vaccination, and I have to be very careful saying that, but so far, I don't think it's that bad, for example, as in the United States. It's people seem to vaccinate at least the usual like child programs. Generally, I, I don't see any big situations where people would deny that, uh, but the anti-vaccination sentiment is there just like everywhere else, and we'll see if this changes. And religion is on the rise, so we're still optimistic. <laughs> so, yeah, thanks. Did you even say who you were? Oh, yeah, yeah, people. Uh, Susan asked me if I actually said who I am. I'm the founder of Skeptic Society in Russia, and uh, uh, we started like a year and several months ago, so we're very new. We're not the only ones who do this, but we're the only one who, the only organization that actually does skepticism as opposed to, for example, just science, or, uh, and we're the ones who go offline. So we have weekly meetings in several cities right now. We're doing a weekly podcast, which is crazy. If you are doing a weekly podcast, you know. And we do some other stuff. And we're planning to do a conference this year. So we'll see how it goes. And your name? Oh, my name. Right, right. My name is Kirill, Kirill Alferov. So I, I, I was just used that. I have the name here. So I just didn't give it a second thought. <laughs> okay. Thank yeah. you so yeah. much. Thanks. Thank Thanks for having me. Oh, a question, a question, no? Uh, they're free the first month, then you have to pay a subscription fee. <laughs> but you can go and try and sign up for the newsletter.
All right. Fantastic. Well, thank you. Um, now, uh, my name is Bob Blaskowitz. Um, I'm a skeptic. Uh, uh, who is uh, working out of Wisconsin. I'm formerly, formerly of Atlanta um, and St. Louis and all over the place. Um, I'm an English teacher um, and I'm involved with all of these projects up here. Um, and I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, skeptical activism and some of the stuff that, that seems to have worked, the stuff that has really left an impression on me. Um, as I've uh, moved along to to work on a number of projects, but the the, the big one is the Stanislav Brzezinski uh, issue. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So um, uh, I wanted to start with suggesting that there are two important principles uh, of of good activism, and they come they both come from from women who I admire very much. Um, the first one is, is Dr. Pamela Gay. Um, a couple of years ago, uh, she said, uh, don't ask for permission to do something awesome. Um, and I thought that was wonderful, and that kind of got me kind of charged up to do something big for, uh, about Brzezinski. Um, and the, the second bit of advice uh, comes from Barbara Drescher, and it's an important caveat uh, to be uh, added to that first one. Uh, and I paraphrase, make sure that you know your stuff first. Um, because if uh, you are a uh, if you're a loose cannon, you can cause more damage than uh, uh, if, 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 if you if you are uh, uh, you know one of the reasons why uh, Fraser Kane does so well with uh, promoting say astronomy is because he really knows you know his technology. Um, it would it you you might hurt your own cause if you didn't exactly know what you were doing. Um, the the first. Uh, 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 project that I, I wanted to mention that I've always been impressed by um, was uh, Robert Lancaster's uh, Stop Sylvia. Uh, yeah. um, I think that it, it, it's kind of like an archetype of what like online skeptical activism can look like. Um, and, and it covers a classic paranormal skeptical claim. It's just right down our uh, What's the word I'm looking for? Our alley. Alley? Okay, yeah. So I guess it, yeah, it's it's just the type of thing that we do. It's paranormal. It's psychics, you know. And one of the things he does one thing, and he does that really, really well. Um, he collects the 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 predictions of uh, Sylvia Brown are collected. I guess there aren't any more. I mean, unless Chris picks them up, um, uh, they are. Uh, he collects and breaks them down into testable, uh, uh, falsifiable claims, and then goes through and just ticks the box. Did they get this, uh, uh, say, uh, uh, this abduction case? Uh, did they find the body where she said they'd find the body? Yes or no? You know, um, was the perpetrator, uh, you know, a, a blonde, thirty-year-old man? Or yes or no? And overwhelmingly, we find out that that she's wrong. So keeping a scorecard. Um, it's straightforward. Sylvia, yes. It's a, that, There's one. That's it's it, awesome. It, it, it marked it up to clean living. Um, yeah. So Sylvia Brown was a notoriously um, uh, bad psychic uh, who was on Montel Williams' show. Huh? No, just notoriously. Oh. Yeah. No. Um, she. Uh, Kind of started even a church um, around herself, yeah, um, yeah, and she she was just uh, one of the highest profiles uh, psychics for a number of years because of her prominence on the Montel Williams show. Uh, he promoted her almost completely uncritically, as far as I can tell, if not completely uncritically. That's right, yeah. I mean, even her last prediction was how long she was going to live, and she got that wrong, too. So, yeah. Uh, she died about a year ago, maybe, maybe a little bit more. Hmm? During the spring? During the spring? Okay. Um, so, uh, uh, so I guess now it's, it's stopped Sylvia Brown. Um, but, yeah, so uh, uh, Robert Lancaster has... Uh, maintained the site. It, he really did become the uh, go-to person, the authority, really, on Sylvia Brown and, and her scam. Um, 
another important thing that he did was he built up context for her failures. You can say, well, this psychic got this, this one important thing wrong, but when you start piling up this, you know, another important case, they were completely wrong, another important case, another important case, until you find out that, you know, something like 10% of her wild guesses uh, happen to be right, and that, you know, that is pretty compelling stuff there. And it's really important in terms of tone that he, he kept himself out of it as much as possible. Uh, Lancaster kept himself out of his uh, calling the balls and strikes here. Um, he, he kind of intuited or, or took to heart uh, Ray Hyman's uh, uh, warning that you should let the evidence speak for itself. Um, editorializing would just look like bias, and that opens them up to additional charges. So it was very straightforward, very clearly laid out, and it was an, uh, an excellent um, an excellent site. Um, the next one uh, would be Snopes. And this is, this is one I, I hesitated to include because I don't know if I see them as necessarily being activists or if they consider themselves to be act activists. Um, they're actually uh, uh, professionals. Um, the San Fernando Valley Folklore Society was founded in 1993 by David and Barbara Mickelson primarily to boost the responses to letters that David was sending out. Um, it turned out that having an official letterhead uh, got a lot more cooperation uh, from, say, the corporations uh, th th that, say, like from Coca-Cola. He has an entire uh, section of Coke lore. Um, you know, he, he saw that he was getting more responses when he had a professional letterhead than when he was just, you know, cold writing to these people. Um, uh, the website, uh, Snopes.com, is now kind of that which keeps Facebook in check, right? Um, yeah. Um, and I think the things that make this site work so well is that it is, uh, it's carried out, it's, it's executed by trained folklorists um, who, again, they keep their, their opinions separate. Um, they're accused of being funded by the Republicans and by the Democrats, um, so, which, which is a good sign. You're probably doing something right. Um, it also seems to be a, uh, a labor of love for them. They do love the subject, and that sustains them for decades um, as they build up a community. Um, and it still seems to be guided by the, by the principles, by the founders. Um, and so just a, uh, just a shout out to Snopes. Um, now, a few weeks ago, I was in Los Angeles talking about the Brzezinski campaign at the Center for Inquiry, and I briefly mentioned the role that Tim Farley had played, um, helping us devise uh, search SEO strategies uh, to help boost good information into uh, the Google searches that Brzezinski ranked well in. Um, and when I asked the crowd if they knew who Tim Farley was, I got mostly s stares, which prom huh? I said, really? Yeah, I know, I know. And which prompted John Rail to, to tweet this. I'm in a theater filled with skeptics who don't know the name Tim Farley. <laughs> so, um, Wait, Tim Farley? Okay, so the, the, I'm going to talk a little bit about the Tim Farley skeptical activism complex. Um, he's, uh, he's the founder of whatstheharm.net and Skeptools. Um, he's kind of the Johnny Appleseed of skeptical activism, as far as I can tell. He is an idea guy, um, and he's very capable. In his, uh, uh, this is what he looks like as a cartoon, <laughs> right? And, but actually, he is that tall. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So. Yeah. So he's, he's, um, he is a, one of the white hats in computer network security um, uh, during the day, but by night he is a skeptical avenger and database maintainer. Um, he's an, the founder of a couple of important websites, what the, what's the harm .net and Skeptools. What's the harm is a searchable, a searchable reposit, uh, repository of stories that document uh, the real consequences of abandoning critical thinking. Um, it came out of a talk that he heard at, at, um, at TAM5, um, which seems to, is that where uh, uh, Skeptic Camp came out of TAM5 too, right? So that was, it was, that was the one to go to, apparently, it was the idea one. Oh, really? Oh, wow. Okay, so that was, that was, a, that was a hell of a TAM. Um, yeah, so um, he, he knew that he wanted to somehow promote critical thinking. Um, 
SkepTools is a blog uh, devoted to issues and technology of interest to skeptical activism. Uh, whether he's analyzing, say, the Wikipedia habits um, of Deepak Chopra and his friends, um, or introdu introducing us to a technology tool that can be used to promote skeptical thinking, um, such as Do Not Link, um, which you know doesn't give people Google juice when you use it, um, so you can you can refer people to a site that you don't agree with without boosting their their ranking or rebutter, which is Shane Greenup's um, uh, Chrome. Uh, I guess it's a variety of plugins now, so um, which adds a layer of meta commentary to the internet. So if you have rebutter installed on on Chrome or whatever. Um, a little window pops up and lets you know when you go to a questionable site, um, hey, there, there are some, rebut uh, some re rebuttals to this you might want to look at as well. So, um, But Tim kind of uh, uh, introduces people to these tools. Um, and he is, uh, I think that, I think that his, his websites really do kind of reflect his personality. Um, uh, to pilfer a phrase, he, he wears a size 32 hat, eats loads of fish, and moves in mysterious ways. Um, he's, he's very clever. Um, uh, he's a reliably hard worker. Uh, he's detail-oriented um, with a very good sense of his own strengths. And he puts those strengths to use. When um, the engineers got together to build Tim, uh, they had two goals, a, a database curating machine um, and to defend the internet from evil. And he's very, he's very good at, at that. Uh, he sent me a, a note um, a couple days ago. He said, quote, one thing I do with both of these websites uh, is specialize. What's the harm does one type of story and that's it. And it sticks to its rules. I don't try to be everything to everyone. Actually, if I had to do it over, I would drop a number of the categories that I have there. So he details uh, stories that appear in the press um, about, say, the, the, the harm of homeopathy, and he collects them all in one place, um, or the, 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 the harm in alt-med or uh, in psychics, uh, in believing in psychics, and that sort of thing. Um, Skeptools, the same way he says, quote, I know there are too many topics in skepticism for me to know them all, so I focus the blog on things I know well and have talents to bring to bear. And what's the, and what's the harms case? That's my good research and curation skills and ability to present information. In Skeptools' case, it's my technology expertise in writing. Um, he's a creative and productive mind and tries to put new technologies to the service of uh, critical thinking. I believe he was, uh, he was advocating uh, the type of stuff that guerrilla skepticism on Wikipedia was doing. Um, and then it took uh, Susan to get that off the ground. So again, he's, he's kind of like the Johnny Appleseed of, of, of skepticism. Um, at the same time, his database curation skills have led to a massive database on uh, a skeptical history and um, uh, a lot of things that have appeared on Lanyard over the last several years. Um, so yeah. Uh, the next group who's done a, a really good job, in my opinion, is is Stop the AVN. In fact, just all of freaking Australia um, <laughs> is, is, is really effective, um, as far as I can tell. Um, Stop the AVN is a face group Facebook group that was established in 2009 to, to fight the influence of anti-vaccine activists in Australia. Um, what they're trying to do is to deny, it specifically it was Meryl Dory, but um, to deny her, uh, the, the, the founder of the Australian Vaccination Network, which is an anti-vax group, to deny her the opportunity to speak unchallenged in the media. Um, uh, and to they, they sought to change the perception of her in the media from being a vaccine safety uh, watchdog um, to being the anti-vax activist that she is. Um, and so they promote the safety of vaccines, advise the media, and put them in touch with real experts on the science of vaccines. Um, uh, they, they achieve this primarily through uh, social media and, and this is important, they complain to the regulatory agencies in Australia um, when they notice that things are wrong. Um, and this is very, very important. Um, the authorities can't take action unless they know that something is, is going on. Um, so that's an important role that skeptics can play. 
Um, they did have an especially awesome action, and I, I just love this one because it was so audacious. Uh, in December 2011, when Meryl Dory uh, appeared at the Woodford Folk Festival, um, they were unwilling to have her tripe promoted to such a huge audience without any check. Um, so Stop the, Avian, Stop the AVN hired an airplane to fly above the fairgrounds towing the message, vaccination saves lives, which is just so wonderful. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, un unlike a lot of the other groups, uh, they've, they've tried to measure their success rate. Um, uh, uh, by looking at the, I think it's the, the financials of uh, the AVN and uh, the, uh, a survey of the news coverage that they've received. Um, and what they have found is that the proportion of unfavorable mentions has gone up since the founding of the AVN uh, for Merrill Dory and for the AVN. So they, they seem to have had some sort of uh, uh, effect. Um, at the same time, they've made sure that every misstep that she's made, and she's made a lot of missteps, um, has received a, a lot of uh, uh, a lot of coverage in in the press. So, um, congratulations to them. Um, next is the 1023 campaign. Yeah, that was a good one. Um, this one uh, I, I I included because it was. It was a global campaign um, that managed to harness the, uh, the internet for skeptical purposes. A, a large coordinated intercontinental um, campaign. They even had someone in Antarctica. Uh, yeah, so they got someone on every continent to participate. And, uh, um, it originally, the 1023 campaign started as a, a, a letter writing uh, an open letter to, to Boots, a, a pharmacy chain um, in the UK. Um, but over time they decided they'd try to uh, draw some additional attention to that letter by staging an overdose. Um, the idea for which came from a, a Belgian skeptic protest, uh, according to Michael Marshall, who I corresponded with preparing for this, um, he said that the idea was to have as many people as possible to do it. Um, the first time around. In the second year, they wanted to recruit as many cities as possible. Um, and uh, th their, their most important goals, he said, were to raise awareness amongst the general, amongst, because they're from the UK, uh, amongst the general public that homeopathy uh, is not herbal, um, but has nothing in it at all. Um, the, to raise the profile of uh, skepticism in skeptical groups and to create networks between skeptical groups and to encourage new ones to form. And some groups, you know, uh, coalesced around uh, this cause and, and, and still exist today. Um, what they said were their most uh, important uh, lessons to impart to, to future uh, skeptical protests is one is, is to um, uh, allow the, well, um, how do I do this? Um, they were, they had tremendous organization. They were extremely prepared. Um, they anticipated everything that could possibly go wrong. Um, they analyzed their first overdose um, and the response to it and then prepared stock answers for the objections that were raised the first time around and used those stock answers to put into their carefully prepared press releases that they then sent out to all of the, and, and packets that they sent out to all of these uh, participating cities that would be easy to translate um, so that everybody would have uh, uh, all the answers that they were likely to need at their fingertips. Um, they also were very careful about how, uh, about what exactly they were saying because what happens if you say something and it, invariably it's going to end up being used somehow as propaganda for the other side. So they're very aware of crafting their messages uh, so that they wouldn't be as useful to the other side. Also, um, they, th this one I thought was very uh, interesting was uh, they only gave out 1023 t-shirts to people who they thought were trustworthy. Um, yeah, so, um, and it was really a, a, a 
heck of a thing that they did. Um, the last bit was uh, they, they attributed a lot of their success to asking people for help um, instead of telling them that you know they should be doing this on, uh, uh, what day was it, on February 6th, right? Um, uh, so letting each city draw on its own strengths and uh, carry out its activism in its own way was very important too. Uh, next is, is uh, uh, Skep, yes, sir. Yeah, do you want to save questions till the end or should we just wait the end? No, let's go to the end. Yeah, let's go to the end. Okay. All right, cool. All right. Um, next is, is Skepticamp, um, which is the brainchild of Reed, Esau. Yeah, there he is. Um, and it was conceived following his experiences at TAM5, as we said. Um, he realized that a large amount of expertise um, in the skeptical world was, was untapped when you have kind of a, uh, a, a, in the typical conference. There's a lot more expertise out here than there is up here. And he was looking for a way that, you know, maybe we could mobilize this and, and turn this into a way to, to uh, uh, maintain uh, active participation in the skeptical community by giving people something important to do, um, at the same time bringing down barriers to participation. Um, so, uh, uh, let me see. So in, in, in recent uh, correspondence, um, and I feel like I should have you read this out loud because that would be really interesting. Um, no, but I figured, quote, I figured I couldn't start something that would rely on my drum beating as I will quickly burn out, not crazy, about doing promotion either. It would need to run on its own. It would need to offer multiple facets of, val uh, of value to appeal broadly. So he knew what he was willing to do. He took stock of his uh, capabilities and his preferences and then he ran with it. Um, he adopted the, the, a distributed model of, of conferencing that originated in the tech community, the bar camp model. Um, in which every attendee of a conference is also a participant and a, and a producer. Um, by putting participants on stage, it gets newcomers involved um, with the hope of Im Im improving retention in the skeptical community. Um, it also, uh, you know, this is important, develop the public speaking skills of the rank and file um, uh, skeptic, uh, an immediate benefit for, for local groups. Um, it, showcased, uh, it showcases research that taps participants' enthusiasms and um, distributes the cost uh, associated with putting on a, a conference among participants. Um, uh, lastly, uh, it, it, it serves, um, it, 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 I think one of the interesting things about Skeptic Camp is how the, the, the various groups that put them on have kind of developed their own identities. So there is a, a, a strong sense of bonding and even some rivalries. Um, that have that have uh, grown out of it. Uh, yeah, Colorado was it Denver and Atlanta uh, are, brr, yeah. So, but no, it's friendly, uh, friendly competition. So um, there have been over 80 skeptic camps at this point, and hopefully more in the future. Um, and then I want to talk about the one that I'm uh, most familiar with, the, the the project that I've been involved with, and and this is um, the. Well, the Brzezinski birthday bash and assorted Brzezinski activities. Um, this, Brzezinski came to the attention of, of the skeptical community in a big way uh, when Reese Morgan, uh, a teenager from Wales, was uh, threatened, uh, and other bloggers, uh, was threatened with legal action by somebody who didn't have a law degree or a license to practice law. Um, and they tried to shut him down. This guy had been hired by the Brzezinski Clinic, uh, which has been operating in Houston for about 40 years, um, treating patients with fractions of human urine um, that are now uh, uh, produced in a, a factory that he owns, uh, Stanislav Brzezinski owns. Um, he'd been hired by the clinic uh, to improve his web reputation Brzezinski's web reputation. That didn't work out so well. Um, because as soon as we, you know, people heard that Reese and these other bloggers had been threatened, um, the backlash was enormous and is ongoing. Um, uh, a number of, uh, one of the first things that we, we did in a big way um, was to have the, um, uh, the birthday bash, which was kind of a, it, uh, 
you know, I'm extremely proud of, of what skeptics were able to do. Um, there was a lot of uh, uh, tumult in the skeptical community at the time, and nonetheless, we were able to bring together a wide variety of people uh, to participate in um, the birthday bash. What we decided to do as a group was to uh, start a, uh, uh, a fundraising campaign. Uh, we would raise $30,000 uh, for St. Jude Children's Research Hospital, um, and then we would donate it in Dr. Brzezinski's name, and then challenge him to match our donation, um, thereby once and for all showing that he did something to further cancer research. Um, he declined to meet that challenge. Um, but we did raise about $15,000, and it was, uh, you know, it was a crazy couple of weeks. Um, and in the run-up to that, uh, there were, well, there were a couple of other things that were going on at the same time. Um, uh, in the run-up to that, I, I started the other Brzezinski patient group. One of the most effective ways that the Brzezinski Clinic uh, recruits and retains uh, uh, believers and patients and victims um, is through the, the testimonies of uh, the patients who have gone and for, for some reason have survived. Um, there were a lot more, there are a lot more stories of people who have gone and who haven't survived and we started collecting those very early and started putting them on a website, uh, the other Brzezinski patient group, which you'll see at the upper right. Um, skeptics were also, uh, uh, and that actually now ranks very well. Um, in Brzezinski searches, so it is. It, it doesn't prove whether or not the the treatment works, but it just shows that it's not a uh, it's not the miracle cure for these incurable childhood brain tumors that he supposedly specializes in. Um, the only thing that I see him really being good at is a wallet biopsy. Um, but uh, another important movement uh, a moment was the BBC Panorama, uh, which is kind of like the UK's 60 Minutes. Uh, they got interested after Simon Singh contacted them and let, to, let them know that UK uh, children were, were streaming into Houston in order to get this, this quack cancer treatment. Um, the uh, response to this on uh, uh, the Twitter feed uh, for the show was uni uniform horror, and so that was a big skeptical win. Um, let me see. Uh, we've also been monitoring the Brzezinski Clinic's uh, attempts to um, publish and, and, you know, kind of use the trappings of science to promote their, their uh, goof. Um, so recently there were two articles that were, um, you know, they, the, the, the patient group was, was trumpeting these two new articles that were, were published. Um, the, uh, the first one, uh, we found uh, the journal that published it was on Beale's List, um, which is a uh, li librarian's rather authoritative list of suspect journals, um, corrupt pay-to-play um, or scams. Um, so that one, you know, uh, take, take that for what you will. Uh, the next one, Child's Nervous System, um, I wrote to the editor after they published this. I said, you know, this guy is, is about as trustworthy as Wakefield. Um, why, did, why did you publish this, this horrible, tiny fragment of a trial? And, and he said that, unfortunately, the reviewers of the journal failed to provide their promised evaluation so that uh, after several months, there were no negative comments to justify rejection, which is staggering. Um, so it wasn't peer-reviewed like the patients were promoting. Um, and uh, recently, um, you know, just the other night, I got confirmation that I will have a note appended to this article um, when it's published uh, discussing some of the ethical problems surrounding the trial. So hurrah. Yay. And then um, one last thing that, that, that's very important, I think, was uh, happened in November, which was Liz Zabo's expose, her investigative work on the uh, Brzezinski Clinic. Um, uh, skeptics, um, uh, physicians, um, uh, and other activists all contributed into making an amazing story um, uh, that uh, brought the, the skeptical version of Brzezinski's story to 
uh, something like three and a half million people. Um, if you look at the online and print uh, numbers, uh, that was a major that was a major win for us. Um, let me see. Um, and then lastly, this just happened. Um, uh, this this yeah. So there's there's a complaint. <laughs> The Texas Medical Board released a 202-page complaint, or a, a list of charges, basically, against Stanislav Brzezinski. Um, a lot of the charges that they're bringing up um, are things that we've seen in the patient stories, things that we've suspected, um, all, everything from financial shenanigans uh, to treating people who haven't had a firm diagnosis. Um, that's probably where the survivors come from. Um, but so uh, we are very optimistic at this point, um, even though he seems to have gotten his clinical trials back by means that baffle us. Um, and the skeptics have been so persistent that in a recent movie that was made by one of his supporters, and this just cracked me up, um, that we were portrayed skeptics, and this is a screenshot, we were portrayed as like evil masterminds behind the scene who are paid by big pharma to, to, to bust up Brzezinski. Um, and I, I, I take that type of insult as, as a badge of honor, honestly. Um, you, you know you're doing a, a, a good job when you make the right enemies. Um, uh, and I wanted to use this opportunity to ask you um, for uh, some assistance. Um, two things. Recently, a young woman uh, by the name of uh, Abra Hall uh, died. She was one of uh, uh, Brzezinski's patients. She had a she had a really bad brain tumor, um, and they the family went from Washington State down to to Houston to uh, for for treatment, uh, where thirty six thousand dollars of their something like that thirty four thirty six thousand uh, uh, dollars, where they lost that money to Brzezinski and and felt like they were pushed put back. They ended up in the USA Today article. Um, and I know that the, the, the mother, uh, Stacy Huntington, uh, has gone to the Texas Medical Board to complain and intends to, to see this complaint through. Um, Abra died on the 3rd. Um, and I was hoping um, that I could make an, a, an appeal. They're raising money to, for burial. And I would really appreciate it if you would consider going to the bit.ly link down there at the bottom, Skeptics Help. If you could see it in your heart to um, perhaps donate and, and help take care of one of Brzezinski's patients. Um, the other thing that um, I'd, I'd like to ask you to do, so skeptics help at you know, Bitly, um, is to go to another Bitly link, let's end this, um, and go to Senator Claire McCaskill's uh, submit a scam page and thank her office. I met with them about two weeks ago and they seem to take the issue of, of Brzezinski uh, seriously. Um, they were asking questions about, so who's on board? Who have you talked to? Um, so uh, if you could thank them for taking an interest and assure them that this is worth their time and worth the time of the staff, if you could go to bit.ly, let's end this. I would greatly appreciate it. Um, and next, leave it up. Okay. Left up, cool, all right. Everybody got that? All right, we're good. And with that, I would like to go to Susan and these people. Um, okay. So now I'm going to have to use your computer, right? Yep. Or do you want me to just, you don't think I could do that online? Oh, you can just tell me. I'll, I'll advance just, it. Yeah, whack me under the table. Well, I don't know. Okay, is that on? Well, first off, I really want to um, thank you all for being here today. Um, I think that uh, one of the things that Bob said was how important Tim Farley and uh, Robert Lancaster and others have been to our, to our movement, and I think that we really need to give more kudos than he has taken to Bob Blaskowitz here for all the work he's done. He has given up 
hours and hours, if not weeks and weeks of, of labor to this uh, Brzezinski, um, whatever you want to call it. And I am always inspired by him. I don't know how he finds the time to do this, and I'm always overwhelmed with the things he does and with such passion. So I, I want to just apply to Bob here for all the work he's done. Um, totally inspired. <laughs> and um, so, all right. I would, I am so glad you're here. This is the end of TAM. You guys are, should be all fired up. I know you're tired as we all are and not getting a lot of sleep. Has this been an awesome TAM or what? I mean, yeah. <laughs> Woo! Great lectures, lots of stuff. What you're not seeing a lot of is, in my opinion, is enough activism, enough workshops that are teaching you how to do these things. And Bob and I talked about this. Oh, by the way, my name is Susan Gerbic. Um, and Bob and I talked about these, this, this, how we were going to do this workshop. And I should mention Bob and I, Tim Farley, Mark Edward, Jim Underdown, and I will be doing a workshop for CFI in October in um, uh, LA and hopefully if it's successful we're going to be doing more workshops in the future at different places and we will come to your town if you can get enough skeptics together who will actually pay so that they'll pay for our room and board we're cheap you know and you know we can sleep on whatever they can sleep on couches and things and and airfare we will come and we'll do an activism workshop which is this is kind of a an idea of what we're going to do but it's much more hands-on. So Bob and I talked about having you guys break out in groups, having you guys start working on problems, and do some real activism today. But we just do not have the time. But this is what we want to do, and I think this is what is needed. Because a lot of these lectures and, and conferences you go to, it's very passive. You sit in the audience. You are listening. And it's wonderful and great. And that's what I did for many years. And finally, after listening to Tim Farley, I said, it is time for me to stand up and do something because I am done. It is, we are need to get this done and it's, and we've just been preaching to the choir for far too long. So now is our time. So this lecture that I'm about to give you is um, going to be very quick because I only have so much time. All the information I'm giving you is going to be on my website and um, so you're not going to be able to take notes quick enough, and I'm not going to be able to have time to explain everything. So I apologize in advance. This, what we're doing is Bob gave you kind of what we have done, what projects have done that were successful. What I'm going to do is I'm hoping to inspire you to take on something. So close the doors because it, lock them. No, I'm only kidding. Because <laughs> you're not getting away from me because I am a skeptical activist and I feel very passionate about the fact that we need to stop preaching to the choir and start doing something to get rid of this nonsense that's out there. I'm really tired of it. Now my main project is guerrilla skepticism on Wikipedia and I don't have time to go into detail of explaining it about it to you. If you want to join my Wikipedia project we need you especially if you speak other languages but it is work. My teammates are uh, the my peers are amazing the stuff they do it is incredible and I train and I train and I train and it is a lot of work but some people find it fun work you know I mean it's work but it's fun work to some people so it's not made for everybody so I'm not going to be lecturing on GSOW today sorry because we're going to talk about the things that are probably you know, you guys can find something that fits your lifestyle, something that maybe is something that's going to take a lot of time or something that's very, very quick. And as I said, I'm going to go through these fairly quickly. Um, we had, I, you, we've been here together for a few days now, and you might have seen that some of my friends thought it would be embarrassing to me to, um, you might have seen, to hold the sign up over my head when I sat down that said, Susan Gerbic is the most powerful woman in skepticism. And I laugh because I don't embarrass, but, um, and it's been kind of fun. And it's a joke, okay? You know, I know I'm not the most powerful woman in skepticism, but I wanted to kind of just bring that back out to you all. You all are the most powerful people in skepticism. When we are together, especially with crowdsourced projects, there's no stopping to us, stopping us. All these wonderful things that Bob mentioned and more we can achieve and do if we just kind of find our passion and you guys match up to the things that are probably the things that are your that you feel passionate about okay and so 
Bye. So here's where we go from here. So this is kind of what I'm talking about. We're gonna, uh, this is Daniel Loxton, one of my favorite people who, who started off with a blog and um, talking about, and see, you're gonna find all these links. You'll be able to go to these links when you go to my website that'll have, you know, so you can find all this information. So like I said, try not to write it down. Just try to absorb all the information I'm gonna give you as quickly and just go, leave this room going, wow, I feel inspired. I wanna do something, I wanna do something. I think there's something for me to do. And maybe it's not exactly what I mentioned, but maybe it's gonna inspire you to think of something else that is very similar to it that you have the special skills to be able to do. So, all right, here we go. Where do we go from here? As you can see what it says up there. One of the things you should do is follow Tim Farley's blog, Skeptical Software Tools. He has mm -hmm. the tools that are gonna make whatever project you want to do easier for you to do if that makes any sense whatsoever. So he's just got the, the software and the, all, there's all kinds of things out there that are being invented all the time that Tom, uh, Tim writes about. So this is my website, susangerbic.com. You are going to find these slides on susangerbic.com, hopefully today, and then you'll be able to, to go through these. So here we go. So GSOW is a project that is three years old. Happy birthday to us. We just had our third birthday. And many of my teammates are here, a lot of them have the, the gorilla shirts on that I'm wearing, see? Thank you, thank you, Kyle, from um, Carbon Dating. Carbon Dating, oh my gosh, I went right over my head. Carbon Dating for giving us this awesome logo and uh, for free, he's just an awesome guy for doing everything he can. This is something that he has done for skepticism, has given us a better logo and, and you know really inspired us to be more of a team. You can buy these, by the way, on Evolve Fish. All right, skeptic action. Some of you have my little uh, cards, business cards for skeptic action. This is one, some follower said, it's uh, one action a day will help keep pseudoscience at bay. We, you can follow this project on Facebook, Twitter, or Google Plus. And this is something that once you're signed up for, and by signing up, I mean you've downloaded Web of Trust or Rebutter, it will take you maybe 30 seconds a day. This is a project I started because nobody was doing it, and I thought how wonderful Web of Trust is and Rebutter is, and I do not have time to go into detail what those two are, but they're amazing skeptical projects that, well, Web of Trust wasn't meant to be a skeptic project, but it is, just like Wikipedia. That's, it's, it's you know, dominated by skeptical rules, you know, of evidence and so on. So Web of Trust and Rebutter are both on my website with videos that uh, Shane Greenup, who is the uh, owner of Rebutter, he made a video just for the skeptic action followers to show you how to do it and that kind of thing. But this is a project that will take maybe 30 seconds of your day once you've got the plugin installed on your computer. Easy, easy, easy stuff to do. Fun, fun stuff. Fish Barrel is another program, um, um, another thing that we aren't using very much. We started to use it. This is a site that the FD, that allows you to be able to go to a, a website that's making medical claims. Uh, once you fill out all the information on the website, um, then the next time you do it, it just takes like two or three minutes. You're able to copy and paste and put into Fish Barrel um, all the information that a website is making a medical claim. So like a homeopath or whatever, if they're saying that they can fight cancer, you copy it, you, you hit a few other buttons, and it sends an alert to the FDA that there is a website making a medical claim. So that's, a, that's something that's really awesome. We just need to start using it a lot more. Um, and these are other ideas of things that people have done and maybe you can assist with. This is a very, very good friend of mine and a f very great friend of um, um, the JREF, um, Kitty. And um, she had an, a website called badaliens.org and this was a website that she had run for a while. I think it's kind of gone now. Um, if this is something that inspires you, you can contact her. She's easy to find. and. Um, start working on this. It's a website for people who think they've been abducted. She's very kind, just like Robert Lancaster was. People could come to you and um, talk about the, the fact that they think they've been abducted by aliens. We have to remember as skeptics that regardless of the fact that we think that's nonsense, but to these people, they feel it is real. This is a real experience and it must be terrifying to think that you can't sleep at night because you may be abducted by aliens. So it's, it's a terrifying thing and I think we need to be kind and she's helped so many people by talking to them about things and trying to encourage them to go to the doctor and you know that kind of stuff. Here's a book she wrote with um, 
a very talented uh, artist named Noah uh, Whipple, I believe, who was here at TAM last year. And this is a book uh, on fairy tales, children's fairy tales, and the proceeds usually go to uh, the JREF. So this is something that can be done if you have an artistic nature. She's just taken fairy tales and just changed them around a little bit. Jeff Wagg, who is uh, an older, uh, older, he's, an, he's a friend of mine from you know years ago. He has a project called College of Curiosity, um, and he's always looking for people who are interested in that. So just take a picture of that screen if you, if you were, if, or just go to my website. The 1023 campaign, which is Bob has already mentioned, is another one of those. I, I don't know what it is with the Australians and the and the um, and the people in the UK. They just they're just maybe they're just really detailed or something, but they just come up with some of the most awesome things. This is Skeptic Cal in California, Berkeley. It's held every year around May. And this is the largest overdose of people taking um, uh, a suicide. I photographed this. I think there was 200 and something people taking an overdose. How many fatalities? Uh, we're still, well, the numbers aren't in. None? Yeah, <laughs> Greg says none. Here's another project that somebody had suggested to me. I think it was Bob was talking about this. Uh, like a What's the Harm uh, site that Tim Farley does. This is What's the Harm Dr. Oz. Maybe this would be something where somebody could kindly collect uh, ideas, uh, I mean, uh, you know, possible things that he has done that, and collect it in a way that's readable, uh, well written, and, you know, so that it would come up in the search engines when people are looking for Dr. Oz. Lanyard, this is another wonderful site that I hope that every single one of you is going to be using when you go home. Everything that is about a conference, every blog, every podcast, every video, your Facebook portraits, as you put them up on Facebook, you're going to take the URL and just stick it into Lanyard. That way, everybody can see everybody's photos. Everybody can see everybody's photo, uh, blog, uh, podcast. And you don't have to own it. It doesn't have to be your blog or your video. This is, this is um, something you find. Like this lecture right now that's being recorded will go on Lanyard, so you'll be able to find it. My slides will go on Lanyard, and so on. And this way, we can all kind of network together. GSOW uses this site all the time. Um, skepticality, all right. This, I'm on Skepticality every two weeks. I love a lot of podcasts. There's so many great podcasts out there. This is a, um, um, a winner of the Occam Award from the UK this year. I was very honored to be there to accept the award. But I'm not speaking just about Skepticality. You know how you listen to these podcasts and they say to you at the end, if you like our podcast, could you please go and rate us? You know what? They mean it. We need you to go rate these podcasts. If you take just a few minutes a day or every so often, rate a podcast. The, every time you rate it, it brings up their, their, um, their notoriety. It, it helps out. It branches out. And it's getting beyond the choir when you're able to do something like this because there are people out there who still haven't heard about skept, uh, scientific skepticism and, and so on. How many people in this room have come to TAM or whatever because of a podcast. Thank you. All right. So we need to rate these podcasts to get them out to others and continue. So rate a podcast. Maybe every time you change your light bulbs in your house, you know how you, you're, uh, you change your time in your clocks twice a year? Or well, those who change your time? That might be a good idea. Here's a, here's a project that is done by uh, Pamela Gay. And uh, I know she needs help, I, she needs support, she needs help in this. This is a really great uh, thing to look into. Uh, Penny for NASA, this is a prog, uh, uh, something kind of from Neil deGrasse Tyson, who um, has talked about if we could just get a full penny for NASA's budget instead of the half a penny that they're getting right now, we could change the world. <laughs> but um, so, <laughs> So Nathan, Nathan Miller over here sitting down, one of my, one of my great editors, the leader of uh, one of my uh, English Wikipedia <laughs> teams, who's just totally embarrassed right now. Uh, he wrote the Wikipedia page for Penny for NASA that we first put a mention on Neil deGrasse Tyson's Wikipedia page when he came out in Cosmos. Neil deGrasse Tyson's Wikipedia page views went from 100,000 a month to 330,000 views a month. And so Penny for NASA is now receiving about 1,000 views a month because it's on his page. But first, uh, Nathan had to create the page. It took a year, but we got it. So this is a program. Look into it if you're interested in astronomy and increasing NASA's budget. I know they need your help. Franklin's List. Ah, 
Love this. This is a friend of mine, Shane Trimmer, has, and friends. Eugenie Scott, I think, is also involved, so you know it's awesome. So uh, Franklin's List is an action. What they're trying to do is get, check this out, what an idea. Let's raise some funds and help support people who are STEM, you know, science, medicine, all that kind of stuff, into office. What a concept, okay? So this is something else if you mm -hmm. want to, if you got a few dollars you want to donate or if you want to run for office yourself, which would be really great. Odds must be crazy. If you guys have not seen this site, you need to go here. This is an IIG uh, project. John Rail and Wendy Hughes um, have come up with this idea and Jarrett Kaufman had, um, was the, the originator of this Odds Must Be Crazy. This site is a backdoor to getting people thinking about odds and coincidences and you need to get this and have your coworkers look at the site and so on because this is a very easy way to talk to people who are perhaps a little not thinking the way we would probably like them to think in the critical thinking area, but you can have conversations, really great conversations about coincidences and what does it really mean when you have a, when you have a coincidence. They break it down, they tell it in a fun, entertaining way. You have to check out the site. This is definitely the one you showed your, your friends and family. Here's a friend of mine, uh, Brad Levin in uh, the UK. I met uh, when I was in, uh, lecturing in QED this last year, which if you can't, if you can get to QED, go to QED. It's in uh, Manchester every, every April. Skeptival is just that. It's gonna be a free thinkers in a field. This is a man who's, who has run conferences uh, for years and he's going to try to put on one and he's looking for volunteers and people to help out with, with that. Doubtful news. What a great idea. Sharon Hill, I'm sure, always needs some help. And if you can help her out with, with this, this is also getting out beyond the choir. Uh, Edinburgh Skeptics, here's an idea uh, that they did. Ghost busted tours in their town of Edinburgh, which we, uh, we were just in, which is an amazing place. You should go if you can. Uh, Edinburgh Skeptics, I'm very, very impressed with them. They uh, did their own ghost tours, but they're ghost busted tours, creative idea. Um, and uh, anybody get the reference down with this sort of thing? Uh, okay, cool. Um, Sterling introduced me, my son Sterling introduced me to um, Scientology add on, on kind of activities. This is really powerful. Apparently, in Germany, well, in, in um, Berlin, um, Scientology is almost done. They've almost closed up shop. They've only got like 100 members or something like that. And part of the reason is because of Anon protests. So, you know, logical fallacy tarot. This is uh, Trucky Lynch. He is coming out with some beautiful tarot cards that you can use for logical fallacies. He's been working on this project for a year or more. He could definitely use some encouragement to finish. Because um, everybody's like, I can't wait till we get these cards out. You'll be able to use them in a lot of different ways. Maybe using the beautiful, beautiful artwork in your online discussions every time somebody does a logical fallacy. It's better than saying, that's a straw man. It's like, ooh, you can give this beautiful card. So, Trucky Lynch, you can see his name on there. Uh, here's a couple more things. A good friend of mine in Salinas area, Monterey County Skeptics, he has a Christmas tree farm. He's going to be doing school lectures um, talking about you know, evolution and, and bringing in the school kids to, to talk about, you know, the growth of trees and all that kind of stuff. So maybe somebody in this audience has some kind of niche where that is something that might inspire you to think of how you can get school kids to and talk about biology and so on. Um, science festivals like the Edinburgh Science Festival, um, Dragon Con, they were doing, and several other cons, they were doing kind of fun stuff and then they added on the science stuff. So Edinburgh Festival every August runs for the entire month. It's an arts and crafts kind of thing. Well, they did a science, they went and did a skepticism thing and just latched on to it. So possibly your town may do some kind of festival that's science related or whatever. If you can bring skepticism in there, bring it in. Uh, reserve your local library, show the movie Cosmos, invite the public. Easy thing to do if you are so inclined to do that. Get involved with science classes. You can mentor for science uh, camps, judge. If you're into astronomy and you have a nice telescope, it doesn't have to be super fancy. It's not the Hubble. We don't expect that. But if you can volunteer with children in groups and say, and say hey, I have a, a, a telescope. Can I bring it in? And we can show the kids um, Saturn and so on and Venus. 
please do so. I mean, that's really appreciated. Vaccine clinics, I, I think this is so important. You can contact your local uh, uh, the vaccination areas and ask them, do you have any need? Uh, can, can we, do you have literature that I can just, just uh, hand out? Blood drive, same thing. Sponsor speakers to events. If you, have, if you have money, this is what the screen is for, if you have money or access to money, um, you can, some people, you know, do, there are people, I'm told, um, sponsor people to go to events. You could uh, give micropayments to a uh, podcast or video cast or, or uh, things that means a lot. A $10 donation a month, $5 donation a month means a lot to these people to keep their projects going. Frequent flyer miles. Good Lord, let's donate them to different conferences and see if they can fly in speakers, especially if it's a speaker you really want to see. Scholarships to conferences, there's all kinds of these different things. People have great web skills, they just need to donate them to help people out. Um, audio expertise, I am not an audio person and I'm learning as I go. People are constantly helping me. If you're listening to a podcast and you just think, ah, it would be so much better if they just did this, well, you know what? The person who's speaking may not have those skills and somebody out here in this audience may be the one who could approach them and say, kindly, um, let me um, give you some advice about how to get rid of this, that, or the other. Artwork, like I talked about with Kyle, Carl, uh, Kyle Saunders and uh, Noah Whipple. If you are an artist, we can use you in many ways in the skeptical. Music, same thing. Here's a friend of mine, Gary Goldberg, that I met at a Mensa conference that I went to, I spoke at. He had, uh, was receiving uh, in Red Plum advertisements in your local newspaper. I think you've probably seen these Red Plum. They were advertising, um, I can't say the word, it's a homeopathic drug for flu. It starts with an O and it's about that long. And um, he wrote to them and said, look, this, it's flu season. You're, you're, you're advertising on sale. It was some sale having on this homeopathic drug. And that's not a cool thing. And they said, you know what, you're absolutely right. I'm going to forward your your message to the, uh, av the advertising people or whatever it was, and they've stopped plugging this, this uh, homeopathic flu medicine because this one man wrote one letter and <coughs> followed up. And then here's another thing. There was a website, uh, a newspaper article, I think this is the Washington Post. You might be able to see down in the corner, there's several doctors that are mentioned uh, for this diabetic study. He contacted those doctors and said, did you realize that your name is being used? And they were like, whoa, we did not know that. So then that was able to get that changed. This is something he just did on his own. Mark Edward um, and <laughs> Teresa Caputo, he, uh, oh my God, I don't even know where to start with activism this man does. But um, he uh, was hired by Inside Edition to go to a, uh, to out her in ways, and he's wearing on his, he's, he took this with an iPhone, and it was an early great colleague, sorry, but on his lapel, Mark is wearing a picture of his son um, who has died, and um, Teresa had told him quite a bit about how, what a kind soul his son was, and so on, of course. She was not able to pick up that her his son is very well, much alive, and that uh, Mark is a skeptic with a big S. Thank you very much. So um, one of the things that Mark Edward advocates to you all is that if you are so inclined, you may have to spend some money. You may have to put some money in these people's pockets, but what you can do is so powerful. You go, you sit in the audience, and when they make a mistake, you laugh. And you laugh heartily, and you laugh loudly. He says these psychics are entertainers. That's what they're doing up on stage. They are entertainers. And if you mess with them a little bit and you bring the mood of the audience, it will set off all the other people in the audience and they can't throw you out and they can't do anything to harm you. And they, it, it's just, you're just laughing. So practice your laughs or something beforehand and just be like, you know, get your, get it going. <laughs> oh, this guy is hilarious. So, um, <laughs> You, what you're going to do is you're going to try, and you get in the audience and you laugh, like I said. It, you can sit in the cheap seats in the back, too. So whatever you can do to get on their nerves and make it so these people don't want to come back and it ruins the whole mood of the thing and then they are thrown off the whole rest of the time. Oh, my gosh. Uh, here's another thing that Mark Edward did. Uh, he, there was a medium that's yeah, on uh, ABC's uh, website, and uh, he 
called him up over and over. This medium was giving evidence, uh, giving help and stuff and all that stuff. So he kept calling him up. You know, they said, oh, we've got an expert on stuff. We've got an expert on stuff. It's this medium. And so he kept calling him up saying he wanted to talk to the medium. He pretended he was an old man saying that he would just lost his wife. And then he'd say, then he'd call back another day saying that he was, you know, on health. He needed health experts. And they kept, you know, like they'd hang up on him or they'd put him on hold for like an hour. So this man, Ramon B-O-L-Z, I'm sorry, I'm not going to pronounce it, who read Mark's blog, he just a uh, school teacher, elementary school teacher in that area, he wrote to that station's that station and said that he's an elementary school teacher and that he would love to have the psychic uh, take the million dollar challenge because the school district needed the million dollars so bad and so he asked if he would and he <laughs> talked to them as if it was his child he says my kids you know it would be so wonderful she could prove her abilities and we could get this money and we wouldn't have to you know lay off all these teachers and we could do all this and he talked like in that way and guess what she was removed from that website they said if and every time we contact we contact him afterwards they said you're just going to have to contact her herself. We, we don't have any. Con we don't have any. We don't have anything to do with this woman. And you know, when Mark said, "Well, what's her contact?" Her, then you'll just have to Google it. So they were really upset that these. We just made trouble for him. Is what Mark and uh, Ramon did. Are you local to a conference? You know what? Fifteen. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, if you're local to a conference, can you please maybe help out the other people who are going to be attending conferences with a blog, with some ideas, with. Um, uh, you know, places to eat, where to go, things to do. I'd love to see a skeptic tour map of people who like to travel, things to see in areas. Um, historical sites, um, Janine here in the front row. Um, also here, uh, this is the um, Jerry Andrus site. They got this, this uh, building, his home, put on the National uh, Register of Oregon, preserving this home and all his artifacts. The Robert Ingersoll birthplace, it was the same thing was done. We have conference, we're having a conference, CFI is having a conference, I believe in August, that's going to be talking about Robert Ingersoll and how important he is to our history. Um, here's the, what I said about laughing. Amazon donations, Nathan Miller was starting up, you didn't know you were in this, did you? Was starting up a site whenever you're gonna go to Amazon and buy something. If you go through a skeptic's website first, you just click on the skeptic website of your choice that has an Amazon link, and then go make your purchases on Amazon, they get a, a few pennies of your, of your purchase each time. And uh, Nathan was trying to come up with a way of doing that so that you would autom so you, if you forgot, you know, it would remind you or something like that. So see Nathan Miller right there. Uh, Independent Investigations Group. Oh my gosh, I can't even go there because we're gonna run out of time. Fundraisers. Knitters for skepticism, uh, crafts and, ide and items donated for scholarships. We need donations for all kinds of things. Um, if you're being sued by Wu, we, what we would like to have is somebody to come up with some kind of way of funding, a uh, fund set up for people to, to donate yeah. to that in case you're being attacked. Uh, the JREF and the CFI also have teacher guides. We need to find a way of getting that best to our teachers and to, uh, maybe a central site to kind of get this out there. Donate your magazines, science magazines, skeptic magazines to the waiting areas of your doctor's office, your oncologist, your, your local woo. Um, skeptics in the pub event, if there isn't one locally in your area, start one. If there is one, attend it and always thank your organizer. Buy them a meal once in a while, say thank you. We're trying to get outside the choir, so please review our books and thank our authors. Um, they don't know, and also on the podcast, Run for office on your local school board. That's where you're going to have the most effect or just to support them. Uh, become an expert on something. The other Brzezinski patient group, we've already talked about that. The book review project. This is Kathy Moyd, whose hand is going to right there in the front row. This is something that she's going to be uh, running. It is, we are coming with names. Uh, we came up with the idea of Amazonian skeptics. What the idea is, and we're not sure of that, what we're, and that kind of fits the gorilla stuff. <laughs> But what the idea is, is that we're going to, well, what she's going to coordinate is people who are interested in writing reviews of paranormal books. Be probably before they come out, she has a way of getting the books. Um, thank you, Skeptic Magazine. And they're going to get the books and you can, and a uh, free. And then you would read, read the book and write a very nice review. I mean, not a nice review, but I mean a well-written review. Not like a full of ad hominems and all that, but a well-written review. And then we can put it up on Amazon and other, uh, other places like Barnes & Noble and so on, so that whenever the book comes out, 
there's already some really well done reviews uh, about the book and that can help a lot as well. So she's uh, coordinating that effort and um, you know, if you're interested in reading books, you know, somebody's got to do it. So I believe I am done if, uh, let me see, was that everything? Gosh, I did that faster than I thought. So I really apologize I had to do that so fast. And I believe we are ready for Q&A. Questions? So get up there and ask. Questions, try to, try suggestions. To pull. The answer is F. Scott Fitzgerald. It always is. Is this on? Yes. So uh, but the first thing I wanted to say, just real quick, was, you, Bob, you mentioned the 1023 campaign. Mm -hmm. um, I just wanted to caution everybody, especially here in the US, if you're ever tempted to repeat what they did, right. repeat that demonstration, be very, very careful, especially in the US, because there are many products that are labeled homeopathic, which are not, that do have active right. ingredients. And Yeah, and, and one of the things that, that they put in their packet was instructions on how to make your own homeopathy because you can't trust what's actually in the package. So Good that's point. absolutely true. So yeah. the, the, uh, the, the, the other thing I wanted to ask about was um, some of the, uh, the, the sites that you mentioned, especially those that are uh, that are you know specifically dedicated to fighting particular brands of woo like uh, like stop Sylvia Brown or the 1023 campaign or the other Brzezinski patient group um, and you mentioned stop the AVN as well um, the question I have is you know those those sound great I agree with you it sounds like they're really doing the right thing that sounds like they really have done it have done it well and it makes us feel great and really, you know, gets us feeling rah rah. Mm -hmm. But how do we know that? I mean, we're skeptics, right? How do we know that um, it's making a difference? You know what? Uh, and 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 the, 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 let me let me let me finish. The other the other half of this is um, uh, you mentioned the stop the AVN. They actually have metrics yes. demonstrating their success. And so the, the, in addition to that question, I also wanted to implore everyone, as you're embarking on new projects like this in the future, it would be best if you, th you know, think, like a, think as skeptics, think as scientists. It would be best if, we, if, if from the very beginning, you plan from the beginning, how am I going to measure success? Because as, as, as you know, Susan, we have limited resources and manpower and we want to be as effective as possible it's true uh, and 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 that's um the the stop the avn um they had interested uh uh people who were in the social sciences who were able to uh you know evaluate the 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 work that they did um it, for something like the other Brzezinski patient group um you know i'm just an english teacher who's writing stories um uh, but we, the way that we, we've kind of, we figure that we're doing all right is by looking at our Google rankings, um, uh, the, 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 the way in which uh, people have volunteered their own time and, and uh, talents to translate, uh, for instance, the Brzezinski page into, into Polish, just right. taking it to his native language, <laughs> yes. Um, uh, and, um, you know, we, we, we hear that there, the the Brzezinski clinic seems to be firing a lot of people, uh, laying them off. So um, we think that there has been a, a, a change. Um, but w you're absolutely right. If you want to convince people, if you want to convince skeptics that you're, what you're doing is worth doing, find a way to, to measure it. Yeah, absolutely. Well, not only convince people that what we're doing is worth doing, but also we don't want to be doing things that aren't effective because that's a waste of our limited resources. Right, right. We want to totally agree. hit them as hard as we can. Mm -hmm. um, if I may, one last thing. The, the Look, one we, suggestion. we don't have a lot of time. We don't have I, know, we, I know we're living on time. Just uh, uh, CIFAR, the Center for Applied Rationality, they have a lot of great suggestions mm -hmm. on how to, to do this kind of uh, metric. Cool. Thank you. Thanks. Cool. Hi, guys. Hello. Um, nobody wants people to get involved more than I do. And you guys went through a long list of different things that people can do. Um, but the two activities that you guys are best known for are things that you spent a lot of time diving into and landing. Um, Bob, in the case of the Brzezinski stuff, you spent two years doing this stuff. Susan, you spent what, three years, four years? Three. On three years on uh, GSOW. And I mean, those have been 
in most skeptical metrics, immensely successful. Some of the most successful things we've done, I applaud you guys for that. Um, but I want to take a second to talk about being effective and get your take on this because you, talked to, you both talked about the 1023 campaign and uh, how effective it was. Well, I ended up writing the Q&A for that because the communication was so terrible. Mm -hmm. um, and so I, uh, could you spend a minute talking about how people can actually dig in, do things like, I don't know, press training, adding whatever it is that their, their, uh, their level of expertise is, and picking one and really diving into it versus doing a lot of things at a very shallow level. Well, Jay, I see your hand going up there for somebody as an expert who would love to run a website or something to volunteer. <laughs> Jay Diamond, for reason for reason, is his name. Uh, well, and you, you know group. I already do about 47 different things. Yes, yeah. you know, but that's, uh, that's three shy of 50. So you're, you're <laughs> you know, we got a little more room. So what we so we need people to find that there is a problem as you have just done, and as the gentleman said, that we need more, better ways of measuring um, things. We need people to step up and say, "This is a problem. I think we could do this better. Here's maybe a solution for it, and I'm taking it on. It's my baby." So that's how I would throw it right back at you, Jay. It's a great idea. So yes, we need people who can probably look at things like the 1023 uh, campaign and say, this wasn't quite written. And we're not talking necessarily the British one, you know, I don't, I'm not sure, yeah. but um, maybe when it was done, the American version, I think. Well, actually, like, when, that, when that went to go worldwide, I mean, they had done something that was very tailored to Britain. They really hadn't thought through the Q&A. Right. I've seen this in a lot of skeptical activist events where people just haven't quite thought through how to, how to take all that stuff out there. And I had the advantage of being press trained by a Fortune 50 company. I see his hand going up higher. What do you guys Thank think? Thank you very much. <laughs> but um, just just this idea of adding some um, uh, some value where, I, I where think you have expertise. There would be a, a lot of value in professionalization of this sort of thing. I would love to see money behind this. I'd love to see some lawyers behind this. I'd love to see some trained press people behind this. You know, C CFI and, and JREF have done a great job supporting a lot of the skeptical activism, um, but we still don't have that core you know, um, activist uh, uh, foundation uh, upon which to build uh, those those uh, edifices we'd like to see go up. Um, and if if you know ways of doing that, or you know lawyers who are willing to devote some time to this type of thing, please let us know. We'd we'd, we'd love to see it. Cool. So Thank absolutely, you. professionalization Thanks, is key. Last question, I guess. Uh, we can always continue the discussion later. It, just find us somewhere else. Uh, uh, my question builds upon the previous two. Uh, you spoke about a bunch of the uh, successful uh, activism projects. I am as interested in the, the failures, big and small, of the skeptical a activism projects, uh, in part because I think we have a lot to learn from them to understand what causes a particular activism project to crash and burn is to avoid making that, those same mistakes in the future. And I was wondering if, uh, if you could give some examples that you know of, of where uh, projects have, uh, have struggled and why they have struggled and what we can learn from it. I, I think the first one that, 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 that comes to my mind is, is where I met Susan. Um, we, we were doing a, a uh, trying to coordinate something to, to kind of expose chip coffee. Oh, yeah. Um, and and there, we were trying to use the global network of skeptics in order. Chip Coffee, he's um, a, a psychic who uh, tells children that the voices in their heads are real. All right, so he's psychic kids. Demons, ghosts. Yeah, and so um, uh, he he tours and he he does his his. He's really not a great cold reader, um, but he has a lot of, of of fervent fans. And we got uh, you know we we a number of of groups around the country to show up at his um, uh, it, it, well, at his book signing and at his shows uh, to take notes and to you know kind of survey him. But we didn't really have an end game. We didn't like really have a plan. And so we had all this information but nothing to do. You know, we, we didn't, it wasn't tailored. We have since done something similar with the, the, the Brzezinski uh, group when they were showing the, the new movie where the skeptics are portrayed as an evil cabal. Um, and we wanted to know everything that was said during the Q&A with the filmmaker. 
because we would send those to people who would be able to put those statements in context, and that actually led to things like um, once, uh, uh, it, it, it very early on during the, when the movie was making the circuit uh, of uh, pre-release screenings, uh, we heard that the patient group was gonna start um, a website, ANP for All, and so we decided to grab the Facebook page, the Twitter handle, and everything that we could in order to delay that and make sure that that you know, um, uh, didn't get off the ground. And we did hobble them. And that was because we had a plan. And we specifically knew that we wanted that type of information. Um, so yeah, do you have a? Well, and I was just thinking that chip coffee thing. That was, that was something else. We, we were really working on that. And like you said, I think most. Uh, Mark Edward and James Hunterjan and some of the IIG people went through that. Mark Edward got thrown out for <laughs> some of the things he was doing. I remember this very clearly. It was pretty funny. Um, you're absolutely right, Reed. We need to know the, the where we fail, and the problem with it is is that we just do not have the time. We could do a whole workshop on things that failed, and when Bob and I talk in October, maybe that's something we we'll be talking about with our audience and, and hopefully coming to your town or your country or city, just you know, get your skeptics together, get your piggy banks out and help us pay for the airfare, we'll go. And we can talk about the failures and then as a discussion, the group of people will discuss why it failed and how maybe we could have fixed that and, and, and moved on. But in my experience, and this is just my opinion, I think most projects fail because a lack of leadership the person who is in, who who is in, who decided they wanted to do the project didn't understand the encompassing enormous amounts of time and energy that's going to end up having to take over you. You're, it's going to rule your life. You're going to dream about it, and you can't get away from it because you become so passionate about it. And a lot of people do not have the time and energy, or the just the personality to handle some of those things. Um, I think about um, the IIG starting up in, in many areas, and it just their intention is good, but they just don't have either the skills, the support, or the time to follow it through. It fails, and then everybody gets discouraged, and then nobody else wants to start anything else up again. It's, it's, it's the people. It's all about the people. It's all about you um, having the passion, following through. Bob and I and many other people are always here for you for support until, of course, we totally burn out. Um, and... Um, so then we'll need to come back and go back to you. The next skeptical activist to step up, I'm hoping that there's people out there today to step up, step up. I did want to mention really quick, I do have some editing Wikipedia brochures if anybody wanted those just generically. You don't have to join my project. Just, you want to take them home so I don't have to take them on the airplane home. But, but yeah. You can always talk to us later. Bob and I are very approachable. We're very easy to and find. If, if you would like to be on the, the action list, um, for uh, Brzezinski stuff, uh, contact me at skepticsprotect at gmail.com. That, that's the best way to get on that list. Cool. Okay. Yes. One question. Kathy. Cool. Yeah, the, the not quite named Amazonian skeptics, not for sure positive that's the name, but um, Kathy, she's going to have her information on, on there so that you guys, this is a project where to start here. Most projects start at TAM. Most, yeah. most projects are inspired by TAM. I have been, and you know, TAM and the other workshops, uh, other conferences at CFI, when you leave a conference like this, you know, conferences are amazing things. Go to a conference. If that's the first thing you do, go. Absolutely. And if you don't have one in your area, start a skeptic camp or a meetup or something, you know. Absolutely. All right. Well, thank you very much, thank folks. Thank you for coming. Now, now get out there and do get some skepticism. There.